Philippians 2.8 says this, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Let's pray together. Well, Father, we come before you this day to remember and reflect on the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, as we do so, as we sing, as we meditate, we pray that you would be with us, that you would be glorified in the person of your Son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Please stand. Up to the hill of Calvary, my Savior went courageously, and there He bled and died for me. Hallelujah for the cross. And on that day, the world was changed. A standing for the reading of God's word. We're going to read Psalm 22, verses 1 to 18. Psalm 22, written hundreds of years prior to the coming of Christ. Starting in verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy. O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. 
To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag with the head, saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, because he delights in him. Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breasts. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. There is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws and you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. This is the reading of God's word. Let's pray together. Father, we realize that though it was David who penned these words, that David was not just describing circumstances relevant to his own life, but was looking beyond himself to the son of David, who would come after him and would lay down his life for the forgiveness of sins. That even in verse 1, where David writes, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That even if he posed that question, sensing as though he had been forsaken, that it ultimately wasn't him that was God forsaken, but Christ. And we know the climax of that statement was expressed by our Lord upon that cross. In response to you, Father God, having made him a curse, that he might deliver us from the curse. In response to you pouring out the full fury of your righteous wrath and indignation on him for our sins, where your justice was satisfied for all of our wrongdoing. And so, Father, we come before you with great praise as we know and understand that it was Christ who was forsaken, that we would not be forsaken, but instead receive the forgiveness of sins and reconciliation with you. And so we thank you and we praise you. In Christ's name, amen. Please be seated.
love so amazing amen well let's stand together and lift our hearts to the lord my worth is not in what i own but in the strength of flesh and bone but in the costly
just a man. Dear dying land, thy precious blood shall never lose its power. Fill all the ransomed church of God, be saved to sin.
air. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. You may be seated. to our wonderful Savior who is on the cross. And so with that, I invite you to open your copy of God's Word to the Gospel of Matthew. And we'll be in Matthew 27, and we'll be looking at the account of the cross. John Wycliffe lived in the mid-1300s, and he was termed or labeled the Morning Star of the Reformation. So he was before the formal Reformation, uh, but is often thought or considered that he was a a pre-reformer or a precursor to those events that we are familiar with, uh, leading to Luther and Calvin, And the term morning star has been used um, in the sense of planets that are in the sky or or a star. Uh, Most notably Venus, for example, is the star that is brightest right before dawn, easily visible in the night sky. It appears again in the pre-dawn when darkness still dominates but it's a a glimpse of promise, of light, that the morning will come. And so this man, John Wycliffe, is situated historically between the darkness of, of the word, the lack of it, and the morning light to come, which we know is the Reformation. In part of his writings, he had arguments against the predominant views of the church at that time, which was led by the Pope. Uh, one of his theses thesis declares that there is one universal church, and outside of it, there is no salvation. Its head is Christ. No Pope may say that he is the head. End quote. Christ is the head of the church. That was almost a blasphemous statement to say at the time. But yet, he studied the scriptures, knew what it said, translated the scriptures into English at that time, bringing light to the people. His goal was that the people would have scripture for themselves, to be able to see it, to read it, to hear it, proclaimed in a language they understand, not in a formal academic foreign language. And so he was the morning star of the Reformation. And in a similar sense, even more so was Christ on the cross. The light of the world had come, and yet there was darkness. People could not see their Savior. The nation rejected their Messiah. And yet it was at this moment on the cross that the dawn of the light is about to burst forth. This needed to happen. It was necessary. He is the true morning star. And so with that, we we look to our text in Matthew. Matthew chapter 27. And this short section which we'll be working through is an interesting one. Yes, we'll see that Matthew deals with the the crucifixion itself, but through a series of mockery, there's irony, mockings which identify Jesus for who he truly is. And so with that, I've titled this message, Ironies at the Cross. Matthew records statements again from those who mock and revile Jesus while he was being crucified Yet, in these statements, truth, his identity is revealed. 
The irony is that all those who intend to mock and blaspheme Jesus were actually making true statements about their Savior, of which they did not believe themselves. And so we will see that Jesus, through these statements, Jesus is identified as the king, the true king, uh, as the new temple or, or the new sanctuary. He is also the savior and finally the son of God. His true identity is highlighted so that we would believe in him, that he died for our sins and we would glorify in our precious savior. And so this brings us to our text. Look with me, beginning in verse 35, Matthew 27. Matthew writes, And they had crucified him. They divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And above his head, they put up the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way that the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. And we'll stop there. Did you notice Matthew's account of the crucifixion? It's a simple one. Verse 35, when they had crucified him, that's the moment. Again, it's simple. Uh, it's a mere reference, almost as if in passing, they had crucified him. That's it. There's no detail uh, of the nails being driven in of the pain and agony that J Jesus must have experienced and felt. Nothing to say of the excruciating challenge of even trying to breathe as his body weighs him down. Here's a single phrase that depicts the most significant event, the execution of Jesus. And Matthew draws our attention not so much to the actual crucifixion, but rather to all that, that's happening in the scene that is Un unraveling around the cross. So looking at the rest of the verse, I want you to first note who's there. Well, it's the Romans. And when they had crucified him, he says, they divided up his garments. So who is they? Well, look back at, at verse 27, uh, refers to who they are. This is the soldiers uh, of the governor. Um, the ones who had took him into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort around them, they're the ones who were the final hands to lead Jesus out and ultimately to crucify him. They were the workers. They were the ones who performed these crucifixions. They crucified Christ, literally. Yet, let us not forget that this death sentence was not just at their hands. Who were the instigators of this? Well, certainly it was Israel's religious leaders. Look up again at, at verse 20, same chapter, 27. But the chief priests and, and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas to be put, and, and to put to death, excuse me, and to put Jesus to death. It was the chief priests, the elders, at the trial, they wanted Christ dead, that they'd be willing to take this true criminal, Barabbas. Look down in verse 22. Pilate said to them, uh, then what shall I do with Jesus who was called Christ? And they all said, crucify him. The 
verse 24, when Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water, washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. And all the people said, his blood shall be on us and on our children. And they released Barabbas for them. But after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. So we have the Romans. We have the religious leaders, chief priests, scribes. We have the the crowd that was there screaming and shouting, crucify him. They're all responsible for putting the Messiah to death. Furthermore, this execution was not by chance or circumstance. Scripture itself attests to that God was also involved in Jesus' crucifixion. Consider the words of Peter from Acts 2, well after the resurrection, proclaiming the gospel to the nation. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man, and note this, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of lawless men and put him to death. This was the predetermined plan of God. He foreknew it. He was ordained for the purpose of salvation and redemption. God was the ultimate cause. The rulers and the people were also guilty. Never mind the hands that performed the task. Yet Jesus knew this was his hour. The time had come. This was the predetermined hour of final and complete rejection. Jesus himself spoke plainly of the matter uh, earlier in the previous chapter, Matthew 26, 1 to 4. After Jesus had speaking to his disciples, he said to them, verse 2, you know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man is to be delivered over for crucifixion. Then the chief priests and, and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest Uh, named Caiaphas, and they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. Jesus knew and was determined that this was a plan from the Father to be delivered over for crucifixion. And he was willing to do that. And so here it is, back to our text. The soldiers crucified him. Uh, From a few inches, uh, as far as They understand it's from a few inches to a few feet. uh, The the criminal would be lifted up on the cross. And the best estimate that this was now the morning, likely around nine o'clock, that he was nailed to the cross and crucified. But Matthew goes on to note what else is happening. Look at the rest of verse 35. They divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. At this point, Jesus is on the cross, stripped of his garments, and there is certainly no need for these now. This is the end. It was common that those who did the deed got the spoils, as it were. Uh, John records for us that there was two garments of Jesus, an inner piece or cloak uh, of some sort, and and an outer tunic. Uh, The inner one, they they split into four pieces, divided among themselves uh, as their reward, But there's something valuable here, the tunic. Uh, It had no seams, it is said. Uh, And they did not want to split it up. Uh, So they cast a lot to see who would be the recipient of this valued reward. And the significance of this detail we've already heard from Psalm 22. David wrote in his cry of anguish from trouble, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Here it is, in a providential moment of divine correspondence with David, the life of Jesus matched, the death of Jesus matched and fulfilled the portion of this song, among others. This is no coincidence. God is working out every detail until it's done. Even in his death, Jesus is fulfilling 
scripture as a testimony to the glory of God. In addition to splitting these spoils, look at verse 36. The soldiers remained on the scene. And and sitting down, they began to, to keep watch over him there. They remained at the cross. They were to keep watch and to guard these men on the cross. And presumably, it seems fitting that they would remain there until Jesus and and all the criminals were dead. There were to be no rescue. No one could take Christ down from the cross. No one could pull out those nails. No one could relieve his suffering. There would be no salvation from this moment. And the soldiers would make sure of this. And notice the plaque, verse 37. And above his head, they put up the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. And while the soldiers were were present, uh, they placed this placard above Jesus' head, uh, no doubt on top of the cross, and words that were written in, in Hebrew and Latin and Greek. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. No doubt a statement of mockery to shame him. Who is this king nailed to a cross? Normally, such a placard or note would specify the charge of the crime for which this person is on the cross, the reason for their crucifixion. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews, is the charge Pilate wrote down. And again, in a moment of divine providence, John records for us Pilate writing this statement And the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Yet Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. That is it. And so this is the first declaration of Jesus' identity. Ironically, Jesus is the king of the Jews. Though Pilate had recorded this charge, the Jews were saying, no, that's not true. But yet it was done. The Jews understood such a claim of kingship, of sovereignty, was blasphemous if it was not true. Yet they didn't believe. So this man was deserving of death. Surely their king was yet to come. It is not this man. They expected that their king, their Messiah, would would come and establish Israel as a nation uh, politically to to rule over not only their their promised land, but to rule over all the nations, being just and perfect. Clearly, Jesus had not achieved this yet. So the ironic twist is this declaration Uh, which was intended to mock, again, turns out to be true. Jesus is, in fact, the king. He was not the king that they were anticipating, at least not yet, for they were stuck in their own blindness and sin. Where is their Messiah? But they should have known better. If you are familiar with with Balaam, the the, the Gentile prophet from, from Numbers, He was hired by the king of Moab to curse Israel. And yet, he ended up prophesying of their king. In Numbers 24, he says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab and tear down the sons of of Sheth. This star, this scepter, kingly language shall come forth from Israel. They were waiting for such a man. And there's also the statement by Zechariah, which Matthew picked up on earlier. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and endowed with salvation, lowly and mounted on a donkey. You remember that. Monday coming in to the city. Riding a, a colt. Furthermore, Zechariah also records that, that in his reign will be from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. Where is this king? Is this him? Surely he can't be. And no doubt you're familiar with Isaiah. A phrase, the government will rest on his shoulders. 
Their Messiah will rule over all. And we understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of all these prophecies. He is the king. But yet, the Jews rejected him. They did not know. But some did. Remember Mary. The angel told her, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him a throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. There will be no end of his kingdom. Luke 1, 30 to 33. Remember the Magi. Where is he who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Herod heard this and was troubled. This king is a threat to him. So they're inquiring, where is this Christ? And they remembered the prophecy in Bethlehem of Judea. For this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judea, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a leader who will shepherd my people Israel. He is coming. And Paul captures this well in Philippians 2, 8 through 11. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bow to this king and confess his name. He is Lord and king. Do you know this king? Do you believe and confess and understand that it is Jesus who was crucified? He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You have heard that scripture testified to this man, to this God man and who he is. He is now ruling and reigning, sitting at the right hand of the father in heaven. He is ready to return at the foreordained time to gather his people to himself. And when he returns, he will sit upon the Davidic throne in Israel and rule the nations with perfect righteousness, justice, and peace. You need to make terms of peace with this coming king. Do not be among those who say, who who will hear, depart from me, for I never knew you. What a terrifying statement to hear. Sealing the, the state of your soul for eternity. This is the king calling you to come to him. Behold, today is the day of salvation, for he is the king. So the sign said, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Though it was meant to mock, we understand, in fact, it is true. Now getting back to our text, we meet two others. Verse 38. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right, one on the left. And Matthew introduces us to them. They flank Jesus on either side. And Matthew identifies these men as as robbers. But it, it is more likely that, again, it is likely rather that they are more than robbers. Um, The same word is used of Barabbas elsewhere, um, that he was an insurrectionist, a murderer. It was not petty theft, although no doubt it included that. Uh, So it's quite possible that both of these criminals are of the same kind or same kin as Barabbas. Awful people. Rebellious. And so here they are, crucified with, uh, with Jesus, He is in between them, which should cause us to to remember what Isaiah has said in 53. And he was numbered among the transgressors. Was he not? So Jesus, the, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, is considered to be among the likes of cruel bandits, bandits suffering the same end. 
So we've seen the Roman soldiers, we've been introduced to the robbers, and now Matthew pans the scene over to those who are passing by these crosses. Verse 39, and those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads or shaking their heads. Now, this is the time of Passover celebrations, which they, some estimate there to be a million, two million people ascending upon Jerusalem for the festivities. And so, of course, it makes sense. There's people passing by, coming into the city that very morning. But yet, what was their response? They were hurling abuse at Jesus and even gesturing so, so with their heads, shaking. You can almost hear a fool. Now, the actual word here for, for hurling abuse is, is blaspheme, blaspheming Jesus. That's what they were doing, saying. They were slandering him, reviling him, rebuking, as if being crucified wasn't enough. And yet, Psalm 22, all who sneer at me, they separate with the lip, they wag the head. Psalm 109, 25, I have also become a reproach to them. When they see me, they wag the head. And, and what was the content? What were they saying of, the, of this blasphemous reviling? What were these passerbys saying, shouting? Verse 40, and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. And this brings us to the second point of irony. Uh, that Jesus is the new temple or the, or the new sanctuary. The Jews worshiped in the temple, the grounds that was built. Early on in John's gospel, uh, Jesus came into the temple, overturned the seller's tables, drove, every, drove everyone out, and the leaders asked for a sign of his authority to do this sort of action. And Jesus said, or responded to them, John 2, 19, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. Then the Jews, said, uh, excuse me, the, the Jews then said, it took 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? But John's no lets us in. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. And so the Jewish leaders clearly remembered this statement in an attempt to indict him at this trial. Uh, the, the chief priests, the, the council, try to obtain false witness, uh, Matthew 26 records, against Jesus, so that they might put him to death. That was their sole aim and intent. But they didn't find any, Matthew records. And, and eventually false witnesses came forward and said, this man stated, I'm able to destroy the temple of God to rebuild it in three days. Obviously, that's not what Christ was referring to. Now, as a side note, the, the reference to the temple is better understood to be sanctuary. There's multiple words that could be used here. Uh, but the, this one has the connotation of that inner building on the temple grounds where the, the priest would go into uh, and offer the uh, sacrifice of atonement um, once a year before the altar. It was the meeting place where God was condescended to meet and be with his people at this location. So, and I guess by contrast, when we think of temple, it includes not only that central building, sanctuary, but also the outer courts. So I think it is fitting that we understand that this is the sanctuary. This is the meeting place the, where God will dwell among his people. And God was dwelling among his people, namely Christ. So Jesus was identifying his body not so, not so much as uh, the entirety of the temple grounds, but rather, again, the meeting place of God, where, where God's presence once was with them. So Jesus was the new sanctuary of worship, and still is. In him, the word became flesh, and God dwelt among his people. Upon him, the spirit of God descended and, and indwelled him. Remember his baptism. And in him the Father abided. He is in the Father, and the Father is in him. John 14, 10. The true center of worship would no longer be the physical temple building. That would be done away with. It is gone. 
true worship would become in spirit and in truth in our Lord and Savior. And so this is who we worship today, the risen Lord Jesus Christ in spirit and truth. There is no other sanctuary. It is not this building. It is the people of God gathering together in spirit of truth, worshiping in the presence of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God the Father. This is our Lord. We don't have to make pilgrimages to a location. If we have Christ, we have everything and lack nothing. Jesus is the new sanctuary. For that, we are thankful, and he is sufficient. So in a turn of providence, those passing by, though mocking Jesus, were recounting what was true. Jesus would die and be resurrected on the third day. To further the mocking, the people also shouted taunts. Look at verse 40. And saying, they were saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Do you hear the echoes of Satan? Remember when Christ was in the wilderness? The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones would become bread. Or if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. Here, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Could he? Sure. He had the power to do so. He could have called the angels to, to come and save him. But Jesus knew he had to die. To be the Paschal Lamb, the, the sacrifice for sin. For sinners. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Or 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that he might bring you to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Jesus had to die. He was the final and ultimate sacrifice for sin. He could not come down from the cross. And we come to the final group of mockers, the Jewish leaders. Look at verse 41. In the same way that the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him. So representing the nation Israel, the Jewish leaders, again, rejected their Messiah. They could not see him for who he was. But Jesus spoke of this earlier, Mark 8, 31. Upon Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus was teaching the disciples and, and he said to them, the son of man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, by the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. This is what he came to do. Rejected among men. What else were they saying? Verse 42. He saved others. He cannot save himself. And we'll pause there. He saved others. He cannot save himself. Though the Jewish leaders were, were mocking him, Jesus had, in fact, saved others. Had he not? Just consider his ministry. Jesus is the Savior. Remember the hemorrhaging woman? who had the faith to go and just touch the, the cloak, the hem of Jesus. And Jesus proclaimed to her, your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. And she was healed. And when Peter was, was walking on the water towards his master, he became frightened and started to sink. What did he cry out? Lord, save me. And the Lord did just that. Jesus saved from sin. He saved from physical ailments. 
He saved according to faith, the righteousness that would be demonstrated shortly. He saved multitudes among his earthly, within his earthly ministry, redeeming people of, of the curse of sin, granting the forgiveness of sin, which only God could do. Yet Jesus knew that if he were to bring eternal salvation to, to others, he could not save his own life. That's the price of salvation. He had to die. And if Jesus were to be the Savior, bringing about salvation, again, he had to lay down his life. If he had not, if Jesus had saved his own life, there would be no shed blood for the forgiveness of sins. There would be no redemption from the penalty of sin. There would be no peace made available for us with God. There would be no source of salvation. We would all be dead in our trespasses and sins, apart from God, ready to suffer the penalty of eternal wrath. And God would be just in doing so. Yet thanks be to God that there is a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is him through his death and his resurrection that the gates of heaven have been swung open and bids all to come in, enter in. He is the final sacrifice that it can atone for sin. It is complete. It is done. There is nothing left. No animal has to be sacrificed ever again. And yet we fall short of the glory of God and his standards of righteousness. But Christ, again, has paved the way of salvation. You must turn from your sin and repent because Christ can deal with that. We must recognize that we can never achieve the righteousness that God demands, but Christ has through his perfect life, through his sufficient death, and through his resurrection. He is the Savior. Turn to him. And at that moment of salvation, God will declare you the sinner. He can declare you that the just penalty for wrath is paid, paid in full. And he will clothe you with the righteousness of Christ. And the law has been fulfilled in him. What a wonderful, undeserved exchange. Gaining his righteousness and him gaining our penalty for death. Jesus is the Savior, the only Savior. Thanks be to God. Look at verse 42, continuing on. He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. Certainly, as we've already discussed, that Jesus could have saved himself, but again, this was not the plan of redemption. This is not what the Father had sent him for. Death would be the vehicle by, by which Jesus would atone for sin. And so the mocking continues. He is the King of Israel. And then there's a proposal for faith. Let him come down from the cross and what? Then we will believe in him and we will believe in him. Their failure to believe in Jesus for all that he was, the Son of God, implicitly they blame him. He hasn't proved himself. But the evidence was all there. His ministry, his life was demonstrated in the power of the Holy Spirit. Their failure to believe that Jesus was the light of the world and in all that he had taught and in light of all of his miracles, and in light of his perfect life, their heart was hardened, blind, deaf, just like their idols. They needed to be born again. Someone has said, quote, they said they would have believed he was the son of God had he come down from the cross. Yet we believe he was the son of God because he stayed up. End quote. 
One more sign or miracle would not have persuaded them. Him coming down from the cross would have done nothing. They were still dead in their trespasses and sins and therefore blind to all that is true. So they continued. Verse 43, he trusts in God, but God rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. Again, mocking words which we've heard from Psalm 22. All who see me mock me. They smack their lip. They wag their head saying, commit yourself to Yahweh. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him because he delights in him. Yet God was looking on that moment, seeing the perfect sacrifice. And yet, they didn't even realize that they were fulfilling this song. They could not understand that it was God who was at work, working out his sovereign plans of redemption through Christ's suffering on the cross. And then the last moment of irony comes with her final mocking. Let God rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. They thought that that, such a statement or claim was blasphemy, but it was not, for it was true. I am the Son of God. Multiple times Jesus declared that he is one with the Father. John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. John 14, 9, Jesus had been speaking, have I been with you all so long, and have you not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? John 17, 5, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Even after Jesus died, the centurion who was there claimed truly this was the Son of God. Matthew 27, 54. Truly, Jesus was the Son of God sent from God. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This was Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of God. Romans 5, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. It was Jesus, the Son of God, who died the death that we deserved. We deserved that death. He himself became sin, bore the wrath of God at that hour that was meant for all those who believe in him. It is through this atoning work that the Son of God, uh, of the Son of God, that he made possible the new birth. Salvation, regeneration, the indwelling of the Spirit. He has made possible repentance and faith. Sinners are justified. The Father declares them righteous before him in his sight. You can have peace with God. And and the repentant sinner is adopted into the family of God, a child of God for all eternity. And yet, at the same time, We're also sanctified, conformed to the practical, to the image of and righteousness of Christ until our death or the Lord returns. And and he will enable us to persevere by his grace again until the end. And then finally, all those who are in Christ are finally glorified, free from the influence of sin and all temptation, every tear wiped away. Christ has purchased all of this and makes it available to you. This is the Son of God accomplishing through his death, securing his resurrection, saying it is done. And then verse 44. Matthew comes back 
to the robbers who were also crucified. And the robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. They took up the same mocking, the same reviling, joining in with the crowds and the leaders, insulting Jesus in all of the same ways. Yet they were on the cross. And in this moment, rejecting their the Savior, as if their own pain and suffering wasn't enough, they have to join in the reviling. And as we know, one will be saved, but Matthew doesn't mention it here. This is the Lord, and they crucified him. He suffered. We'll see that he, he died, was buried. And yet on the third day, will be raised to newness of life, to glory. He has accomplished what he had come to do. So we don't sit here. We don't wait on Good Friday. We look forward to all that is yet to come, to the risen Lord and Savior praising him for what he has accomplished, what he has done. Look at verse 46. And about the, the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Forsaken by God. And at that moment, and at that time, that hour, the Passover lambs were all being slaughtered. But yet here was the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate Passover lamb, the sacrifice of the Son of God. God's infinite wrath being poured out upon him had been completed. Something that those who are in Christ will never know never taste, never experience. Scorned by men, forsaken by God, Jesus laid down his life until the end. Yet on the third day, he would rise again, demonstrating his sacrifice was complete, sufficient, and available for all, including you and me. The light of the morning star had come. The darkness is now ended. Christ is glorified. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful text. Just to be before the cross, to remember the sacrifice that Christ has completed sufficiently, fully, eternally, and made the way of salvation possible for sinners, that if we would believe in him for all who he was, all that he is, salvation is there to the glory and to the praise of your name. Thank you for a wonderful Savior, we pray. Amen. Please stand. Well, I wasn't sure who that was, but it looked like Pastor Mark with a fire in his belly. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Well, I couldn't think of a better way than to finish off with the power of the cross. Let's sing together. Sinful man. 
1 Corinthians 1.18 says this, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And all the redeemed said, Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.